Hey everybody, this is Gregory from DAP University. So in this video, I've got another guest on the channel. I've got Ellie here to talk about scaling Ethereum. And Ellie is a guest that I've actually had on the channel before to talk about his project Crypto Fighters. Um, so welcome back to the channel, Ellie. Hey, thank you for having me. Yeah, awesome. We're excited to have you back and uh, excited to talk about this uh, topic of scaling Ethereum. So I've had a, a few of the guests on the channel um, discuss this topic uh, for kind of different approaches to scaling Ethereum. So I'm excited to hear your perspective today on uh, this particular solution. Um, so what exactly is the solution called and maybe what's just a really quick high level overview of, of what the solution is before we kind of jump into the nitty gritty yeah so yeah we're going to be talking about plasma cash today and a high level overview is just using side chains to the main ethereum blockchain to scale out the network so we have like we use the security of the main chain and then sort of the speed of a side chain that has potentially like a, a far less decent, like maybe a centralized mechanism um, as a con for consensus, but it's able to do way more transactions per second. So trying to combine those two while keeping the best of both worlds. Awesome. Very cool. And so today we're also going to be kind of talking a little bit, um, you know, about an article that Ellie wrote about this um, pretty in-depth article. Um, you can check out, I'll put a link down in the description below that's going to outline a lot of these things in, in depth. But we're going to be talking about them kind of one by one here on the video today. So um, let's go ahead and try to break some of this down. So if we were kind of starting from the beginning, you know, what's the problem that we're trying to solve? All right. So the, yeah, the problem really is that Ethereum is somewhat slow and transactions can be expensive. Um, and really, like when the network can get really congested, um, at, for example, when like popular games around like CryptoKitties, uh, the network like blew up, you, like transactions became really, really expensive. They basically ground to a halt. Um, so how do we like, yeah, what's the solution to that situation? Right now, the network is sort of, it's okay again. But if like Ethereum does become like even more popular in a year or two years from now, like we're going to have to have some scaling solutions so it can support multiple crypto kitties games and just tons of like payments happening every day. Yeah. Very cool. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so what is this proposed solution to the scaling problem? You know, so you're saying, you know, we've got a network at the public blockchain that anyone can connect to. Um, and anyone can basically read and write data from this, this big public blockchain. We've got you know, people who are building dApps and sending Ether. And anytime people are, you know, you know, deploying smart contracts or writing these smart contracts or sending Ether, they're all creating you know, transactions on this thing. Anytime someone's trading a crypto kitty, anytime someone's sending an ERC20 token, it's all just bloat to the network, right? and it takes a certain amount of time for each of these transactions to, to complete. Um, and the network, you know, the, the gas costs start to rise when everyone's doing this all at the same time. And is that kind of this, the general state of things? Yeah, yeah. I mean, in terms of actual numbers today, I think you can do a transaction. Like if you just want, if I want to send you ether, I could probably do it for like one, two cents. And maybe an ERC20 transfer would be like maybe two to four cents something like that and i could get it through the network pretty quickly um but if we're like talking about like probably december january at the beginning of the year um in terms of like the average <clears throat> the, the you have to pay amount a certain amount for gas that you use so like right now you're paying one to two g way uh which is like a very small amount of ether and at the beginning of the year you were paying 50 g way for a transaction to go through and then it still might take a bit of time um, sure. just to put that into perspective so that makes that could make a transaction 50 times more expensive so if i say it costs like two cents right now to send some uh, ether it would cost a dollar um during peak time which right. could be okay if you're sending a million dollars but if you're sending four dollars to buy something and then 20 percent then an extra dollar just for the fee that's that's too much um and yeah that's actually for the most simple transactions but some transactions on the ethereum network they cost a few million gas so 
So, uh, so simply me sending you money, that costs 21,000 gas. But if I want to, I don't know, deploy a smart contract or if I want to do, I want to breed in crypto kitties, it's probably going to be like a lot more gas. The more storage you use, then the, the more computation you use, the more expensive it gets. So yeah, if you're like, um, it could well cost you like $10, $20 to do some simple transaction um, during peak network time. So that's definitely like a problem that, that needs to be solved long term. And there are lots of ways of approaching this problem. Um, there are like layer one scaling solutions, layer two scaling solutions. Uh, layer one being you're actually improving the Ethereum network. Right. So things like moving to proof of stake, um, some form of proof of stake or uh, sharding. That those are sort of the different approaches uh, the Ethereum team is taking right now. But uh, that is probably going to take a while and a lot of testing. Um, but there are solutions we can start using right now, and that's like taking part of the computation off chain, but still using the main blockchain to keep everything secure. Right. Yeah. Totally makes sense. <clears throat> Okay, so you know maybe um, describe what you know your you know this proposed solution is to this particular problem. <clears throat> yeah, so um, so plasma cash. So there's the plasma paper was sort of put out in the last year or so by um, like Vitalik and Joseph Poon, and um, yeah, yeah there have basically been like different offshoots of it, like how exactly to implement this idea the, the basic idea is to use side chains um and i'll explain more exactly what that means soon but um yeah so there, there are a few forms of plasma that are out there uh the plasma mvp was the first one that was proposed then there's plasma cash that we'll be speaking about there's plasma debit as well and then if you look through the ethereum research uh forums you'll see that there's a whole bunch being thrown out the whole time I mean, yeah, this has all happened in the last year. So like things, things are moving very quickly. Every few weeks you see like more, more um, proposals being put out, ways to improve things, ways to do things a bit differently. Um, but yeah, jumping back. So Plasma Cash, um, <clears throat> the, I suppose the two, uh, some important concepts to realize is that um, <clears throat> the, like well, there, we know there are different ways to scale blockchain. So, Right now, each block in Ethereum is around uh, mined every 14 seconds on average. Um, and, but we have like a, a thousand different blockchains and all of these are doing transactions in parallel. So one way to sort of scale out the crypto space is just like to have lots of blockchains. Um, the, the, like the difficulty with like, so for example, if I have one Ethereum blockchain that is running at like, um, how many, like 25 transactions per second. If I have 10 blockchains, I can run at 250 transactions per second. Um, so that's sort of one way to scale out. If we have lots of blockchains, we can just handle like way more transactions. Uh, on the flip side of that, there's like security concerns. You don't want to fragment the network into a thousand different blockchains because then the sort of security of each one is a lot worse. Um, yeah, and sort of the other item um, is that proof of work is extremely like expensive. Well, it's, it, yeah, it's extremely expensive in a lot of ways. Uh, if we can move off of proof of work, we can do way more transactions per second. So if you look at something like EOS, where they use delegated proof of stake and loads of blockchains that claim, oh, we can do stuff so much faster than Ethereum and Bitcoin, um, they can, but often the, the, they give up on security or decentralization in a lot of places. So the chat, we know ways we can make things faster, but the reason we like Ethereum and Bitcoin aren't faster is because uh, we don't want to give up on security and so, and we don't want a central authority running the network. So th th using these two ideas, this is sort of what Plasma Cash is built off of. Um, specifically what we do at Plasma Cash, we have a side chain running. Um, this side chain, it's like, it, it's, it could be like another Ethereum blockchain. It can, it can use any consensus mechanism, meaning like the blocks can be decided in any way. And sort of the most simple way would be proof of authority. So that means that one person is deciding, one entity is deciding what each block is. So for example, my company is, is the, the operator of this sidechain network, and we decide um, exactly what blocks go in and don't go in. So there would be a problem of um, like, sort of you'd have to trust my company, but Plasma Cash 
sort of what, what we do in Plasma Cash is we remove having to trust the company or the operator. And how that works is um, the Plasma Cash operator, they're busy um, updating the main blockchain with the results. And yeah, they, they up, we don't put everything on the main blockchain. We just sort of put the Merkle roots um, of each block. So each, of the, each block on the side chain has a Merkle root and those Merkle roots we put on the main chain. And those, like once those are committed to the main chain, that basically things are now final. Um, and right. whatever is happening on the side chain has now been committed to the main chain. And at a certain point, someone can sort of move their funds from the side chain back over to the main chain and vice versa. And using the system, basically, you can do like very fast transactions on the side chain. And on the main chain, you like you commit the blocks and that sort of keeps the security of the whole system. That's right. like the big overview of it. Yeah, totally. So maybe if I uh, can, you know, pull, pull some of the pieces out of that uh, yeah. for the folks who are listening. Um, so a lot of scaling solutions sort of operate on this idea of, you know, Ethereum being sort of this settlement layer. And then there are things that happen maybe in a, somewhere else that is trustworthy, and then the final result of that gets sort of finished on Ethereum. Is that similar in this case? Um, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, the final result is put on, on the main blockchain. Yeah, so you see that with stuff like state channels, you see that with like uh, other things, where like we're using something else besides Ethereum to, to do things in a trusted way, a trustless way. Um, with maybe some compromises, but ultimately it's still still decentralized, it's still trustworthy, and, and, and the final result gets stored on the public blockchain. And so in this case, we're using a blockchain that's that's you know to the side of the main public Ethereum network, right? Um, and we're doing some things on this, and um, it's it's basically the end result of what the computations and everything that's happening uh, on this chain is, is going back to the main Ethereum network. And we're doing this with, um, and we only need a certain amount of data, right, on this side chain in order to perform these computations, perform these calculations and, and then actions, whatever you're doing, um, in order for this to work properly. I, mean, I get a lot of that right? Yeah, yeah, and specifically in Plasma Cash, we're not really doing computations on the side chain, the only thing that's happening is transfer of assets. So okay. transferring like Ether, ERC20, ERC721. Sure. sure. So just basic transactions. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, very cool. So, um, so do we want to, I'll just let you kind of take it from there. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I suppose what is worth bringing up next? Um, yeah. So I suppose sort of from a developer outlook in terms of what is actually happening. So we talk about this, the main chain and the side chain and moving assets over, but so, so what's actually happening there? I mean, I think, but if you haven't heard the concept before, um, or, and you know a bit about Ethereum, like it doesn't, we're not actually moving Ethereum over from one chain to another. Like Ethereum is not leaving the main Ethereum network. So what exactly do we mean when we move these, uh, move these assets over? So in practice, what's happening is we have like a smart contract on the main network and that's that smart contract, you, you send it your ether and it will lock up your funds. And once your funds are locked up in the main network smart contract, now the sidechain operator, he'll take a look at that smart contract and he'll say, oh, <clears throat> Ellie just went and deposited 10 Ethereum into the main uh, smart contract, I'm now gonna go and create a 10 Ethereum coin on the side chain. And then this coin, and the, the owner of this coin is myself. So I'll be able to go and transfer this coin to other people on the side chain. Eventually I'll decide, okay, well, let's say I transferred it over to you and you decide you wanna now cash this out on the main network. So right now the coin is locked on the main network and you basically send a withdrawal request to the main network and you ask, um, yeah, basically you, you make a request to withdraw, eventually assuming everything is okay, there's a challenge period in between to make sure you're not cheating. And after the challenge period, the money is released from, your, from the smart contract into your main account. Um, and then, yeah, then it, it's yours again to use as you wish on the Ethereum network. 
So that, that's sort of what we mean in terms of what's actually happening when we like move coins from the main network to the side contract. We're uh, locking up a coin on the main network, then we're creating a coin on the side chain. And when we move back, we're destroying the coin on the side chain and we are then releasing it and unlocking the coin on the main network. Right. Um, into like digging deeper, um, something that Plasma Cash does is. Um, I suppose the reason I think it's called Plasma Cash even is because um, each, like the transfer from the main network to the side chain creates a new coin of that value. Um, I shall explain a bit more. Basically, it, the, my 10 Ethereum that I sent to the side chain, that creates a 10 Ethereum coin. And this 10 Ethereum coin, I can't split it up into two 5 Ethereum coins. Um, sort of like a $10 bill, is it? Is that, yeah, it's a $10 bill. <laughs> <laughs> Not from America, but yeah. So the $10 bill, for example, it can't be split up into two $5 bills. If I want to send you $5, for example, in, in regular cash, I'd give you a $10 bill and you'd give me $5 back in change. So something similar happens in Plasma Cash. Each coin that is created has its unique ID, uh, sort of like the serial numbers on real money. Um, and yeah, this coin basically, it can't be split up into smaller pieces. And this is actually one of the, the downsides of Plasma Cash that like it makes it annoying. So imagine I wanted to send you 3.3 ether and like I have a five Ethereum coin. You, you, you don't have any Ethereum coins on the side chain. So it's like, how do we actually go and do this? So like there are a few different approaches. Plasma Debit is one, a different solution that does this better. You could have like a change maker that maybe has lots of different coins that is able to give us change like in the real world as well. Um, but yeah, that definitely like not being able to merge and merge coins and split them um, is, is a bit of an issue. Uh, also think about when you're cashing out from the side chain, imagine you have like a hundred different coins um, and you want to cash them out. You need to make a withdrawal request for each one. So also there, there's been different research. Vitalik recently had a post about that. I think defragmentation is what he was calling it. But there's, there's a bunch of issues basically because of the split and merge on the side chain. Um, the, the other, so yeah, so we have these coins, they move over, we, they have a full value, um, they move to the side chain. Um, on the side chain, basically, to make transactions, what you do is you sort of, you just sign a transaction, you send it to the, the network operator of the side chain, and um, yeah, that basically gets collected into a block by the sidechain operator. Um, the the worst thing, well, okay, let's so I, the, we'll talk about how things are supposed to work. Um, assuming like the network operator is doing what it's supposed to do, he'll collect like 100 transactions, for example. He'll collect them into one block. Then he'll go and create um, a Merkle tree from that, basically, which we could, I also discuss in the article. We can discuss later if you like. Um, and from this Merkle tree, there's a Merkle root, which is like sort of one small piece of data, but that small piece of data, it can go and verify like the, basically every transaction that's happening, specifically what happens in the Merkle tree. Uh, here's a picture of the Merkle tree on screen. Sure. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. What happens in plasma cache, basically the Merkle tree has like lots of different slots at the bottom. So we have L1, L2, L3, L4 that we can see here and like sort of in a big or bigger Merkle tree, you could have like a hundred different data blocks at the bottom. And in the case of Plasma Cache, each block at the bottom represents a different transaction for a different coin. So over here we have block L1, um, that would represent all transactions that are happening for coin one. And block L4 would represent all transactions that are happening for coin four. So here again, when we, create a coin in, the, you know, in, in Plasma Cash in the main contract, each coin gets its own ID. And then these IDs represent where this coin will go in this Merkle tree. So what happens is I set, decide I have coin 17 and I send it to you um, on the side chain. The blockchain operator, what he does is he takes this, um, this coin, this transaction for coin 17, and he puts it into data block 17 on the, um, in the Merkle tree. Basically, yeah, then once he's, he puts that, say, the blockchain operator, uh, they collect 100 different transactions, you have all these different blocks filled up, and they create a Merkle tree from it. At the top, 
basically it creates the, a hash. The Merkle tree, what happens is you're hashing each level. So L1 is hashed into 0, 0, L2 is hashed into 0, 1. And then those two hashes are combined into a new hash. And you keep hashing all the way up to the tree till you get the top hash or the root hash. That root hash basically is sort of a proof of like what's happening in the tree without giving the entire tree. Um, and in the future, you can sort of prove that something is in the tree. But with this root hash, basically, we can commit it to the main chain. And later, someone can give a Merkle proof to prove that their transaction really is in the chain. And they are then able to cash out their coin, basically, based off of the proof that has been submitted. Uh, yeah, very cool. The point of all this is that no one has to trust a sidechain operator. The worst thing a sidechain operator could do is not commit your transaction. Um, but, like, basically, the sidechain operator can never steal a coin. The smart contract won't be able to trans, like, won't release funds to someone else. They won't release it to the smart chain operator. The worst they could do is decide, okay, someone sent a transaction. I'm never going to commit it into the main chain. And in that case, it's like the transaction never happened. So, yeah, it's sort of an important thing to point out. But Plasma Cash, even though it does transactions really quickly, if you want to be fully certain the transaction went through, you do have the same limitations of a regular transaction. You do have, let's say, a 14-second block uh, time per block. A minimum that you need to wait for the the sidechain operator to commit this to the main chain for you to be certain that your transaction has been like committed to the main chain. Um, yeah, I suppose. Are there any questions on that? Because as we dig deeper. Yeah, no, totally. Uh, so yeah, that, that's that's awesome. Uh, so maybe just for clarification, uh, in case we're not familiar, like. It kind of explain, you know, bas basically how a Merkle tree works, um, like with, with the root and then how you are able to actually use that as a proof. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. So, um, for example, in the, in the, in a Merkle tree is a binary tree. Well, like, well, in our case, we're talking about, um, a binary tree and basically, uh, a binary tree, it, we, you, these blocks you see on screen, we have nodes and we have edges between them. Um, and it, it looks like this tree image. Basically, you have a top hash, and each, each node has two other nodes coming off of it, which will keep mm -hmm. going down. So here we have four nodes on the bottom level. But this could be a tree of like 1,024 um, blocks, for example, on sure. the bottom level, or even more. So that's a, the, the data structure as a whole. Um, from over here, what we have um, each block, uh, each node has uh, some data uh, attached to it. So uh, in this example, we have L1, L2, L3, L4. And this is sort of the data we want to encrypt and put into this Merkle tree. Uh, this could be any sort of data. This could be an image, a video. It could be like four words, um, whatever we want. Or it, it could represent some transactions, which it does in the case of Plasma Cache. Um, to get to create this top root, basically, what we do is, in the case of Merkle trees, we take block L1 and we use a cryptographic hash function. And yeah, but basically, we, we hash block L1. And now what we have in the tree is hash 00. zero. So that will look like some random string of characters like FF123, um, whatever you want, basically. Um, and you, you'll get this sort of this random string of letters that it's difficult to jump back to the original, but if you know the original, you can work out what the hash is pretty quickly. Um, and yeah, so we do this for each block. So we hash block L2, we hash block L3 and L4. So now we have four different hashes and we have four different nodes basically what, that we've created. And what we do with these pieces of data, we take what the hash of 00 and 01 is, these random letters basically, we put them into one long string, and then this string we go and hash them again. And now we've created hash zero uh, in, in the tree, and that represents this node. And on the other side, we've created hash one, and we hash these two together again, and we create the root hash. And um, what's cool about this is th this root hash, it's only one string of letters that you could write down on a piece of paper, but it could be representing like gigabytes of data, for example. Sure. And sort of, I mean, a lot of applications use this, like torrents, for example. If someone's downloading them, I mean, yeah, there's lots of applications for it. But this root hash basically is like a very, very compressed version of the entire tree. 
like, and basically you're able to prove that something just from the root and uh, having a proof, you can prove like block L4 is in the tree without having to have the rest of the tree. So we'll show exactly sort of how a Merkle proof works. But for in this image now, um, it's the same tree that we had above. And if we want to prove, for example, that L2 is in this tree, all we have is the root hash and block L2. And we want to prove that L2 is in this tree. So the way to do it, we don't need to provide the entire tree. We just need to pr uh, provide node A and node B that are marked on the image. So in order to get the root node from this, what we do is we take block L2, we'd hash it. Now we have 0, 1. Um, 0, 1, we take it and hash it against this block A that we have 0, 0. And now we have hash 0. On the other side, we now take hash 0, hash it with, block, uh, with node B, and eventually we get the root node. So basically, you only using A and B, we were able to prove that L2 is sort of the root, the root of this Merkle tree. It, like L2 is in the Merkle tree that is represented by this root. Um, so imagine we have like a tree of like 10 levels deep. We'd, we'd only have to give 10 different nodes instead of like 1,024 nodes. So we're able to sort of do this Merkle proof with like very limited data. Um, and what that does in Plasma Cache is when you're actually caching out um, your coin from the side chain to the main network, um, you're going through this whole process. Um, the main chain already has these routes committed to it. And uh, you want to prove that your individual transaction, which is L2 in our example, so you want to prove that L2 is in this, in this tree. So what you do is you provide the Merkle proof to the network. And it's not a very heavy transaction to do. Uh, you're doing a few hashes, let's say 10 different hashes, and then the smart contract itself is able to verify that, yeah, L2 really is in this root. Of, um, and what it, once it sees, okay, L2 is in the root, it's like, okay, this really is it, part of a block. Now I'm going to check what exactly is L2. Oh, L2 says Ellie is transferring uh, some tokens to Greg. Um, and that, yeah, that's basically that is now being verified and it's in the smart contract. Yeah, very um, cool. That's so, yeah, that's Merkle proofs as a whole and how it's used in Plasma Cache. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, thanks for that clarification. That makes perfect sense. Um, yeah, this is, this is awesome. So maybe, um, uh, let's, let's see. So, so I, what... Um, Maybe what, what do you see as the sort of the direct application of this or direct use of this? Um, yeah, so um, we'll see if it picks up, but I think that like the direct application, it could be used anywhere really. But um, like, I don't know, let's say Netflix decides to do subscriptions with um, on the Ethereum blockchain. They want people to pay an Ether. But so many people use Netflix and so many people are using Ether, Ethereum, let's say in two years from now, that like they just can't handle the load. So for example, Netflix could have its own side chain. You'd, um, you'd move your Ether to it and then you'd be able to pay Netflix sort of quickly. I mean, really, I suppose it, it doesn't, that's somebody brought up an example of Netflix on Reddit, which is why I bring it up. <laughs> but really, I suppose, yeah, it could be anything. Like the real value, I suppose, is just we want to be able to transact. Maybe we even keep our coins on the side chain the entire time. And it's just like day-to-day -day business. I go to a coffee shop. I want to pay an Ether. Happens on the side chain. I want to, like everything I want to do, basically, is happening on the side chain. And the big advantage is there don't have to be any costs on the side chain. Uh, the side chain operator has to run things. So they could decide to charge a fee but they could also decide not to charge a fee maybe they're incentivized in other ways so you could in theory have totally free transactions on the side chain and if you side trust the side chain that they're not going to steal the money for your coffee so you could even assume that the the transaction has happened immediately and sort of within a few minutes you'd see the commitment happening on the main chain as well um, but yeah it's just it's just a way to send around money sort of like any of these sidechain projects um, or like uh, scaling solutions are doing lightning network as well. It's just how can we transfer assets um, quickly and cheaply without having to put everything on the expensive main network. Yeah. Very cool. 
Yeah. So is there anything else um, kind of this article that you wanted to go over about plasma cash, maybe about how it works or um, do you see any maybe direct uh, negative trade-offs that people might not want to make? Yeah. So yeah, I suppose that there, there were still items sort of in the, in the explanation of plasma cash that we, we skipped over right now. And um, I, I suppose each time explaining this, like, the basics you can get across and then there's sort of more and more and more and you, you keep adding to it. Sure. Um, one of the big things like involved in plasma cash is the sidechain operator that we don't have to trust them. Um, they're busy committing the proofs, but for, to the main chain, but these proofs um, with your Merkle proof, basically you're able to prove that your transaction exists, that you send money. For, for example, what if you decided to send the same coin to two different people? Basically, in terms of actual implementation, the smart contract isn't able to check every single block to check that you haven't sort of transferred to, the, to two different people in two different blocks. Uh, oh, the, gotcha. What's called the double spend problem. Yeah. Um, so there, basically, we have this challenge period that happens afterwards. Once I decide I want to withdraw my money from the side chain, what I do is I submit a proof that someone actually transferred me this coin. Um, and then there's, let's say, a period of a week, a challenge period where anyone can come and say, no, that coin, you know, you transfer, like, it was transferred to someone else beforehand. Or you never, you know, there's lots of different ways you could cheat the system, basically. Um, if, like, probably best is to look at the articles online about it. But, for example, uh, one simple case is I send money to Greg and I send money to Bob as well. And Greg is, should be the true owner of the coin but Bob is the one that decides to cash it out. So in a simple case like that, what would happen is Greg would come to the side chain, uh, would come to the, and uh, make a transaction with a proof saying, um, yeah, I was actually transferred the money beforehand and that would then um, cancel the withdrawal from Bob and Greg would be the one that is actually able to cash out these tokens. Right. Um, or it'd also be like a fine for, for Bob uh, when he makes his withdrawal request he'd have to stake some funds uh, which would in disincentivize him from cheating anyone would be able to go and challenge um so yeah but basically based off of that challenge system that's how we're able to keep the system secure and no you don't have to trust the sidechain operator so even if the sidechain operator decides so i don't know do, do like trick people but once he's committed to certain actions on the main chain that like people uh, anyone will be able to come to the main chain and make sure that they're like no one's taking out their coins right um, yeah so, so yeah that's sort of like the last piece of the puzzle when it comes to plasma um the, the challenge and withdrawal period um in terms of the problems involved um so we've been over a few above one one of the problems with this specifically with this challenge period is well one you have to wait let's say a week to have your funds available which is annoying like things are happening quickly on the main chain but now also on the side chain, but now you've withdrawn your money, you need to wait a whole week, which could be really annoying to wait that long. Or maybe it's going to be a couple of days, likely at least. And the other item is you've really got to be careful that no one decides to cash out your money. Um, what if you're not paying attention to the chain? What if somebody decides to withdraw your funds? Um, so you could have different services watching the, the side chain and the main chain, making sure nothing dodgy is happening. But at that point, we need to start uh, trusting the people running the network. Uh, if we really want to be in control of our own assets, then we, we may decide we need to be the ones watching it. And not everyone is going to be able to watch the, the network. Um, hopefully, like how it would work is there'd be lots of different people that are incentivized to watch the network. And basically, it'd be some sort of decentralized watching network that with everyone incentivized um, to watch, like bad transactions won't happen, but there's still a risk of this happening. That's definitely one limitation of the net of Plasma Cash. Um, another item is, I mean, we spoke about the splitting and merging issue. I think that's definitely the biggest problem. And like things like Plasma Debit do that better. Um, yeah, we, we've spoken about the other issues as well. Like finality of transaction. If you actually want your transaction to go through, like quickly, like it could be that the side chain is slower because you need to wait for the side chain operator to submit the block to the main chain. And before they've submitted the block to the main chain, 
it, you have no guarantee that it's happened. You can trust a sidechain operator, but you, you need to wait for them to do that. And if they haven't done it, you assume the transaction hasn't gone through. So based on that, you're actually making things slower. It might take 10 minutes for your transaction to go through instead of 30 seconds that it might be on the main Ethereum network. So yeah. there are like pros and cons to using Plasma Cash. Overall, like you, do, you, wouldn't, potentially, you wouldn't necessarily use it to send a million dollars over the network. You just do that securely on your main Ethereum network. But in other cases, in day-to-day -day transactions, for smaller amounts, this could well be like a good scaling solution for yeah. Ethereum. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And we see this all the time, you know, like we have all these apps, um, like you think about like centralized, you know, payment solutions like Square Cash or something like that, where, or Venmo, right. Where people are just, uh, kind of paying back and forth. I don't know if, if, if you've, you've used these, but, um, basically, you know, these have limits on it. You know, you, I don't think in like the States you can send more than, I'm not sure what the limits are, but typically they're like, you know, $1,500 or something like that. You know, it's, right. They basically make it so you can pay for routine things, but they don't want you using it as like a big professional invoicing software or something like that. You know what I mean? Um, they, they keep their fees down to nothing um, and things like that. So this can even be potentially, you know, a solution for them like that. If you wanted to just send you know, money quickly back and forth for day-to-day -day things, the fast way to do it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cool. Well, um, Ellie, man, that was a great overview. I really appreciate um, your in-depth explanation of all this. Looks like you've got some uh, re references down there at the bottom for people to kind of read more about some of this stuff. Yeah, if you want to see the actual code, so Loom and Omizgo, there are two of the bigger names that have actually like published working implementations. Uh -huh. This is all happening like right now. So like it's quite exciting. Uh, Loom is going to launch one of their games. Uh, zombie battlegrounds i think it's called uh -huh. um so they're actually going to be using i think they're going to be using plasma cash in it right now like they're on in the beta uh of it um so yeah that will be cool to see what happens supposedly they they have a few thousand users playing it right now and we'll see if this is the next crypto kitties if this is like boosts mainstream adoption again right it'd be interesting to see what happens there. <laughs> Uh, yeah. But yeah, there's like, there's a whole bunch of links at the bottom, uh, like if like more in depth, uh, like yeah, a lot of good explanations. Yeah, very cool. Uh, well, also, as far as, you know, uh, connecting with people online, uh, you know, if people want to uh, maybe reach out to you or, you know, hear more about you or learn more about you, where can they uh, do that? Um, yeah, um, what's the best way to contact me? <laughs> well, maybe you don't want to be contacted. I figured I'd just throw it out there. <laughs> yeah, maybe uh, hey, dapworks.co if someone like there's a contact form there so if anyone wants to uh, reach out. But yeah, I work as a full stack developer, sort of like focus on Node.js and also blockchain in the past year, mostly Ethereum, um, a bit of Stellar. Um, yeah, that's that's me. So yeah, very cool. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Ellie, I really enjoyed having you on today uh, again for the second time on the channel. Uh, be sure to check out that previous video. I think Ellie was probably one of my first guests. If not, I don't think, yeah, you were like one of the very first. So uh, yeah. I feel like maybe first or second. I can't remember now. Yeah. Yeah. It was awesome. So uh, again, thanks for coming on the channel today, Ellie. I really appreciate it. Everybody go check out Ellie's article. I'll put down in the description below. Um, Again, I really enjoyed this. I'm sure everyone else did too. I'm going to go ahead and sign us off for today. And also be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already to see more videos like this. Where we're talking about, you know, building um, blockchain technology, you know, building decentralized applications and scaling Ethereum where I have other guests on the channel like Ellie who are uh, kind of bringing in cool new insights about how we can push blockchain technology forward. Um, so again, thanks for watching and until next time, thanks for watching Dapp University.